Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. It's a privilege to hold God's Word and speak it uh, before you this morning. And uh, my, my prayer has been that as God's Word is powerful, that it would uh, that He would show His power through His Word this morning and change hearts, change lives, change our weeks. And we need it. Well, behind every great school football team is a great marching band. Yeah. And every good school's football team's marching band has a loud and proud fight song. Notre Dame, for instance, has the Notre Dame Victory March which says, what though the odds be great or small, old Notre Dame will win over all, while her loyal sons and daughters march on to victory. These fight songs are especially heard right after a win, right after a great win. And this morning, we're going to be in Psalm 95, uh, a fight song in the Bible, uh, a, a victory psalm will be in one of Israel's victory marches. Uh, Now, this is a victory psalm, but it's not to be sung after Israel's ancient football team wins a game, uh, but after they win a great battle, after they see God come through, this is the song that they sing. Uh, Its placement in the Psalter, the, the book of Psalms, is right after, you guessed it, Psalm 94, uh, which is a, a depiction of a, a great battle, and it, it calls God the God of vengeance. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and He is the Lord of vengeance, the judge of the earth who rises up in power over Israel's enemies and brings justice back to the righteous. And it follows this up with Psalm 95, which we're going to read in light of victory. In light of victory. It's similar to the song of Moses after the Israelites' uh, exodus from Egypt in uh, Exodus 15. We'll read some of that later. And this is when God worked powerfully to deliver them. And what did they do? They sang a song. They sang their fight song. And Psalm 95 is like that. So I know that we just sat down, but I invite you to stand again in honor of God's Word as we read the Scriptures this morning. Psalm 95 reads, it says, O come and let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And so today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray together. Father, your word is sharp, active, living. You work through it. You are strong, and all things belong to you. We belong to you. So, God, help us to submit ourselves to you this morning and to be changed by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. When well, light of God's victory... Any, any victory recorded in Scripture for the Israelites or any victory that we may have experienced 
uh, through God's power in our lives in light of God's victory. The psalmist is telling us, telling Israel and telling us too, don't test God, but worship Him in thanksgiving. So this, this morning I want to consider our response to victory. What is our response to victory? The psalmist offers two options. We have two options. One, we can worship God with thanksgiving. Or two, we can wander from God with hard hearts. So first, let's look at what it, what it means to worship God with thanksgiving. We're in verses 1 through 7 of the psalm. It, it starts, Oh, come and let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and again, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Now this joyful noise, as joyful as it was to stop singing for a moment while uh, I was listening to all of you sing, that was a joyful noise. I don't think that this is a joyful noise because it sounds good. Some of y'all are amening because of the people behind you. This isn't a joyful noise because it sounds good or because it pleases the ear. It's a joyful noise because it's a triumphant noise, a victorious noise. This is the noise that you would recognize from the book of Joshua, the noise that the Israelites made when they surrounded the walls of Jericho. They were instructed to march around the city walls of Jericho for seven days, and on the seventh day after they marched around it several times, Joshua instructed them to shout. This shout was a joyful noise. It was a joyful noise. Why? Because it meant victory. It meant triumph over enemies. So why in this psalm is the psalmist instructing us to shout victoriously? We can read it that way. Let us shout victorious to the rock of our salvation. Why would he instruct us to do that? Verse 3 tells us pretty plainly, because the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's not great because we praise him greatly. He's, we praise him greatly because he's great, right? The Lord is a great God. He is so strong that the depths of the earth fit into just one of his hands. You notice that? He's so powerful that the mountains belong to him. He's so sovereign that the sea even is under his control. And this because he created it. This is our God. And out of, out of the sea he created the dry land. He is the rock of our salvation. He worked salvation for our fathers and Israel's exodus from Egypt. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea and Moses led the people of Israel in a victory song that we mentioned earlier and they, they sang together, here's what they said, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior, a man of war, and the Lord is his name. They go on in the song to say, to, to ask the question, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? There's no rival to this great king above all gods. You see, when God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, they saw it as God conquering the Egyptian gods. It wasn't just God uh, delivering them out of slavery and oppression. It was actual spiritual deliverance, freedom that they had not felt before. He had conquered the Egyptian gods, and now he is the only God worthy of worship. 
the Lord, Yahweh, defeated their gods, which is why Psalm 95 says that he is a great king above all gods. Now this is, I want you to hear me, this is what Jesus does when he comes on the scene as a human, Israel's God come as a human. Through his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, Colossians 2 tells us this, that he disarmed the ruler's and authorities, and put them to open shame. Those things that are ruling over you, those, those authorities that you've, you're, the darkness that you're enslaved to, the sin that you're enslaved to, he has put them to open shame by triumphing over them. And not just that, he brought us in on the victory. Uh, we can worship him with thanksgiving if we say with Paul in 2 Corinthians, thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Let us make a joyful noise, a triumphal shout to the rock of our salvation because he has risen from the dead and is a great king above all gods. This is our God and King Jesus. I don't know if anyone here would remember this. I, I definitely don't. But on May 8th, 1945, World War II in Europe came to an end. As the news of Germany's surrender reached the rest of the world, joyous crowds gathered to celebrate in the streets. Clutching newspapers that declared victory in Europe. And later that year, uh, President Harry Truman announced Japan's surrender and the end of World War II. The news spread quickly and celebrations erupted across the United States. And on September 2nd, 1945, formal surrender documents were signed aboard the USS Missouri and designating the day as the official victory over Japan. Now, why would joyous crowds gather to celebrate in the streets, spontaneously just gathering to celebrate? Why would celebrations erupt across the United States? Well, it's not because a war happened. It's not celebrating a war. It's not celebrating the lives that were lost. We mourn those things. The celebrations come because a war was won. A celebration erupted because many lives were rescued in the process. In light of victory, hear me, a joyful noise erupted in the U.S. And I'm here to say that wars will come again and wars will be won again. But the spiritual war that Christ has won should cause us to worship in thanksgiving, not because a war happened, but because a war was won, because lives were rescued. So in light of what kind of salvation God has worked for us, and in light of King Jesus' triumph over spiritual darkness in the grave, the, that death may die, right? How will we respond? With the psalmist, Will we sing to the Lord? Will we make a joyful, victorious sound for Him? It's pleasant to His ears. Oh, come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. He made us and He saved us. This is how we should approach Him. Yeah, yes, we should approach Him this way on Sunday mornings. We let us sing to the Lord, right? This is a congregational victory for us, and we should sing. But on Monday morning, are you singing? Are you making joyful noises, triumphant shouts on Tuesday and Wednesday and the rest of the week? Let us worship God with thanksgiving at all times thanksgiving for all that he has done and all those things over which he has victory. 
But this is just the first half of the psalm. This is just the right response to God's victory. There's another option that you might choose. Not to worship God with thanksgiving, but to wander from God with hard hearts. It's at this point in the psalm that Yahweh, the Lord, speaks in first person. The psalmist introduces his voice saying, today if you hear his voice, and then it proceeds with his voice, then God speaks. He says, do not harden your hearts like Pharaoh did and like the people of Israel thus did at Meribah as on the day at Massa in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof or it could be said put me on trial though they had seen my work. What's God talking about? What is, what's this Meribah and Massa stuff? Well, in Exodus 17, Moses records an instance after the Israelites had been in the wilderness for a time, and they seemingly have forgotten all the powerful miracles that God had done for them, had worked for them. They were thirsty. They were grumbling against Moses and against God about it, about their thirst. They put God on trial when they said, if God doesn't give us some water, he probably isn't among us. God instructs Moses to strike a rock, and so he does, and water comes from the rock. God's faithful yet again. Moses therefore named the place Massa, or testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling, because of their bitterness toward God. Even Moses, according to Numbers 20, didn't heed God's instruction totally, right? Uh, in his anger, he struck the rock twice uh, before Israel and disobeyed God. So why bring this up in Psalm 95? Why would uh, uh, generations later, remember this psalm is written generations after the Exodus, why bring this up again? Wouldn't we want to maybe ignore that part of our past where we forgot God's faithfulness? This is a warning written in Psalm 95. It's a warning so that the current readers uh, of that time and, and now our time would not repeat the sins of their fathers. Don't quarrel with God. Don't test God. God is telling those who would hear him, don't quarrel like they did. They saw God's work in the exodus from Egypt and they saw how he guided them cloud by day and fire by night. They saw how he provided manna for them to eat, but they were forgetful, and bitter, thirsty, weak, and they tested God. Don't be like that. This is what God is saying in this psalm. They, they stand as a negative example. Learn from their mistakes, right? As a negative example, Deuteronomy 6, uh, 16 and 17 says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. God goes on to say of that generation for 40 years, the whole time they were in the wilderness, I loathed them. loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Now, that might sound a little confusing to you. They saw his work, right? But now here God is saying that they have not known my ways. They don't know your ways. I thought you just said they'd seen your work. So in, in verse 9, so that's the issue. That's the major issue is that they have seen God's work but they did not know his ways. Those are not the same thing, okay? If they had known God's ways, they would have trusted him for water in the first place, just like they trusted him for manna or guidance or deliverance from slavery. He has a pretty good track record. Can't you trust him with your thirst too? They would have trusted him in the midst of their thirst and not questioned him but instead of trusting God, they tested God. Therefore, God says, 
What a terrible statement. I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Or my resting place. And they didn't. That generation didn't. God kept his oath. The generation after them was the one, uh, the, the, the one that came after them was the one who entered the, the promised land, the, the land that God had promised them. They shared in the victory of God. Hear me. They shared in the Exodus uh, 14 victory of God, but they did not share in the rest of God. They tested him instead of trusting him. They did not persevere into the rest that God promised. The author of Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, references Psalm 95 pretty extensively. It takes up two chapters, chapters 3 and 4. He interprets it as a warning for Christians as well, not just Israelites, right? He says it's a Christian psalm. Uh, he says on the psalm, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Now, I don't know about you when you read this psalm, Psalm 95, whenever it says in verse 7, the last part, today if you hear his voice, for, for me, it, in my Bible, it doesn't say 2,000 years ago when you hear his voice. It says today, and still it says today. So as long as it is called today, the author of Hebrews says, as long as it is called today, uh, let none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. By the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ victory, if indeed we hold our original confidence to the end, rest. Do you hear this warning language? We must hold our confidence and participation in Christ until the last day, and the rest that we're striving to enter is not the promised land that Joshua brought the Israelites into. The author of Hebrews goes on to say, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day. Of another day. Later on, so then, there remains a Sabbath rest. A rest for us, for the people of God. Let us therefore, us in here, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. God has prepared a rest for his people if we would simply persevere to the end and not wander with hard hearts away from God. So do you, do you see what's happening here? Jesus Christ has won a great victory over the powers of darkness and over death itself and has won a victory for his people, the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And he has promised a great, a great rest to come for any who would believe in him. He's won a great victory and he's promised a great rest. And we're somewhere in between here. Okay, we live in between the victory of Christ and the rest of Christ. And God has left us with options. He's left us with an option, with a choice. We can either worship God with thanksgiving and so enter this rest Or we can wander from God with hardened hearts and never receive that benefit. That's our option. Can we be, be transparent for a moment? There are many days when I, maybe you as well, feel as though my heart is hard toward God. I go on in my own way and forget how he's provided for me in the past. I wonder how things are going to work out with jobs and family and everything else. And I forget that God has not left me. When in fact, if I would just look back, if I would just look back, I would see all he's done and be reminded to press on, to persevere. 
If I would just look back, I would see how he brought me out of the Egypt of my sin. If I would just look back, I would see how he guided every step of my life toward him. If we would just look back, we would see how we have never missed a meal of his goodness. I, you, we have options. We all do. We can worship him and trust him, or we can wander and test him. So, let's look on those who have gone before us as examples, good or bad, to spur us on in perseverance. The Apostle Paul writes it this way, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did. These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands uh, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. It doesn't say Wesley's faithful there. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide. He's good at that, right? He will also provide the way of escape, the exodus from the temptation, that you may be able to endure it. You can resist the temptation to be bitter against God, to test God, to quarrel against God, to forget God, if you would just look back at the examples set before you and persevere, if we would just look back instead of wandering. So I exhort you, Christian, press on. Christ has won every battle. Press on. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Press on. Can we agree to just be silent in light of God's victory? Can we just shut our mouths for a moment and trust God instead of testing Him? We would do well to be silent sometimes. Maybe that's more for me than for you. So, are you fighting battles every day? Battles that can be trusted to King Jesus, who is the rock of our salvation, who's a great king above all gods? Are you constantly worried about your own failures, forgetting that the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods? Must we be reminded that his hand holds the depths of the earth so our worries will fit there just fine too. Press on and find rest in Jesus. Find rest in him. Let's pray together.